All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about the pros and the cons of contract to hire. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's essentially um, you get hired on for a contract, let's say six months, and at the end of it, they either renew your contract, depending on how it works, for a year or another six months, or they hire you on as a full-time salaried developer. Um, so... Uh, someone asked me about this in our AMA, and I wanted to do a, a video going over this because I think it's really important, uh, especially when you're just getting started. And I've, I've recently had some sort of experience to a degree um, talking with recruiters and things like that. Having, and as you saw, I, I take all calls from recruiters because you never know what's going to happen. And um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the pros and cons of it right now. So uh, the first one is the major con is you may not have a job. Uh, that's that's a, a major con. Like, and you're not going to collect unemployment if you don't have a job. If you're a full-time developer, a uh, salary developer at a company, and you leave for a contract to hire, if that contract's up in six months and it doesn't get renewed, there's no, there's no developer, there's no unemployment. So you are just burning whatever money you, d you decide to save up. The other, the other hazard of it is... And I'm going to talk about some pros, but for, in my eyes, there's a lot of cons. Uh, in, in my eyes, uh, it's, you, get, you don't get as much value, but, but it depends on what you're looking for. Um, the other con for it is that you, it's, uh, there's a certain uncertainty with you knowing and stress that goes with it, knowing that, hey, in six months, I may not have a job. And from what I've seen in the workplace... Um, with contract to hire is they may not know till that day, like the last day of their contract. So it's not like you're going to know 30 days beforehand and you can start filling out apps and get hit the ground running. Uh, you may not find out till that day and be pretty unavoidable. Now, what are, what are some of the, and I'm going to jump back and forth between pros and cons because that's how my brain works. So what are, let's, let's dive in uh, a little bit about the pros. The pros are you can get a lot of interesting positions that, Maybe if it was a salaried position that they wouldn't even look at you for because uh, the contract to hire are, are a little less desirable because of the, the risk factor with it. And, um, you know, a lot of developers, you know, myself included, uh, as someone who has a job, contract to hire isn't all that appealing on a straight face-up value. And because there's there's risk in, uh, involved in me being unemployed, while as a, a salaried developer, I don't have that risk. Um, other than if they just decide to fire me or uh, close the project, right? Um, but at least you have the unemployment to fall back onto. Um, now, in terms of pros, interesting roles. And what I mean by that is you may be, you may be more eligible for roles, especially, um, I want to say this in a way that doesn't come off as a, as a, in a bigoted manner. Um, you, a lot of contract to hire, at least in the U U.S., and this isn't always the case, but some of it is to hire, uh, they can't necessarily find the developers locally, so they essentially import developers and give them green cards and things like that. And a lot of times on these contract to hire um, applications, they'll say, you know, English first language, or they'll say um, must be U.S. citizen. So some of those, you kind of... When I see that, to me, that says that they're having trouble finding a position that fills that. And um, you may actually have an edge in getting hired in that fashion if you're okay going the contract to hire route. Now, I I am okay with it, which uh, but under the right circumstances. So in, in my case, I as I said, I talk with recruiters. Um, a recruiter reach out to me, and I have a conversation. Um, and they say, hey, you know, there's this role for Disney. I said, Disney, that's a, that's a big name, right? So, like, I didn't think I'd be working for Disney or any sort of name that I would actually recognize anytime soon. And I said, you're a little on the junior end, but, um, you know, you, you're, you fit the role. And uh, we'd love to, we'd be interested if, you want, if you'd let us submit your, submit your application. And I said, okay, you know. I said, you know, it's, there's, we talked some details, this and that. I said, go for it. Why not? Uh, be, and the reason for it is because of that contract to hire, they may actually be willing to hire someone that as that's more of a junior end for a mid-level role because they are having difficulty filling that. And, and you could go and work at a really good company 
as long as you're willing to contract hire. Now, the the pro, another pro to it is you may have an easier time getting contract to hire when you get started. And the reason for that is because most people want the salary jobs. Most people have families and they have houses and they have mortgages and and they you know they have their kids in the area that they're they're living in and they don't want to move them across country. They don't want to they don't want to put them in a position where you know they can't put food on the table. So those things are a little more uh, heavy risk. But so you may you may have someone who's just has one year experience or getting started be able to grab a contract to hire role a little bit easier than a salaried role. And in, in my experience, the the tests for contract to hire are a little bit easier depending on the company that you're going for. But I wouldn't necessarily throw that in there because because it it how do I put this? Because every every company is different, and so I think that's more of a company basis. But uh, let's talk about some of the more realistic financial issues with contract to hire. Um, and there's some pros and there's some cons. So. A lot of times when you're dealing with an external recruiter, so there's in-house recruiters, which are like, you know, a a recruiter that actually works at Disney would be an in-house recruiter. While let's say there's some company called Tech Systems uh, that is a recruiting company and they get hired by Disney to find the role for it, which is pretty common. And that's a lot of the recruiters that you get reaching out to you over LinkedIn or reaching out to you um, over email and stuff like that. It's it's the local recruiters in the area. They see, oh, there's a developer in, you know, Tampa or wherever you're at, and uh, I want to connect with this guy and see if I could maybe swing him over. Right? That's a lot of what I get, um, and it's probably pretty common. And you say, okay, cool, whatever. So that, as an external recruiter, a lot of times what happens is that uh, forgot to mute that. Sorry, guys. I, a lot of times what happens is. Um, you actually don't get hired by Disney, for instance. In my case, I would have got hired by the the tech recruiter uh, company. And what happens is I am a I'm under contract under them. And so the the big Disney job, you can put that you work for Disney on your resume, all that sort of stuff. That's fine, and that'll look great. But you're actually hired through, and it it depends. But this is a generally speaking, you're actually hired through the company and they're kind of lending you to disney in that instance and so it a lot of what happens is one your contract employee so let's talk about money because as we all know we work a job for money and to provide a life and and get and pay for rent and all that sort of stuff so money should be at top of your mind and sometimes people feel uncomfortable talking about money um and i understand that uh but i i promise you talking openly about money is better for you than not uh, so uh, if you're uncomfortable about that, uh, get comfortable because no one's going to no one's going to pay you more money unless you demand more money or you're worth more money. They're just going to let you be underpaid your entire life, and it's it's important for you to not shortchange yourself. And we're going to talk about how you could do that if you don't do the basic numbers. So in my case, when I was talking with this recruiter, and she said, "Well, what would you need to get paid as a contract employee?" Um, and uh or what what would what's your what's your rate now and what would you for this role what would you need to be paid and so i told her what my rate was and i asked her what their benefit package was uh which may su- surprise you so why do you care about benefits so i thought we were talking about pay well for one off the top uh, as a contract employee you're paying twice the amount of taxes roughly and why that is is when you're a salaried employee how taxes work is you pay for this is a real rough understanding. I'm not a tax master or anything. So uh, um, your employer pays a part, you pay a part. But if you're a contract employee, you pay both parts. So you're paying twice as much in taxes. So let's say in an average year, I pay $7,000 in taxes. It's, it's a little more than that, but let's say seven. So now I'm paying $14,000 in taxes. So automatically I need a $7,000 increase in pay just to break even on that. And then I say, okay, well, what are you know, Mr. or Mrs. Recruiter? What um, what are your paid vacation and holidays? <laughs> they have, and depending on the the agency, they'll have some or they won't. In this instance, they had less or zero, and so we'll say zero. Um, and so I say, okay, so I go from in my case fourteen um, PTO days to to um, 
and 10 paid holidays. And we'll round that up to 25 for easy math when you combine them. So I have 25 days, which is five full weeks of work that I'm basically now working for free unless I'm compensated for. Okay, so I say, let's say my, my average pay is $300 pre-tax per day. I need to charge, what is that, 6000 for 20, 15, $7,500 more. So, so far I need $14,500 to uh, make up the difference in pay. And so, let's say you're making 70, just for you to be even at a contract level, you have to go to 85. And they say, okay, well, what about the benefit packages? I'm currently paying nothing for the for the lowest model of my of my um, health insurance and, and medical and dental, all that sort of stuff. It's going to cost me $200 a month to go with them, $100 paycheck, which isn't unreasonable, but um, maybe it's a little bit better coverage. But now I'm paying an extra $2,500, so uh, 2500 roughly, or $2,400. So I need a $17,000, $500 raise to break even to live the same lifestyle, save the same amount of money. So I go from, let's say, seventy to $87,500. And on top of that, I'm taking more risks now because let's say the average contract is six months. I may not have a job in six months. So uh, for me to feel comfortable, take that. I need a $10,000 raise on top of that, an actual $10,000 raise. You're like, wow, you're getting $17,000 more. Not really um, because you have to you have to factor in what you're losing in terms of that as well. It's just real numbers, basically. You have to factor out the real return. And so, okay, so I go from 70 to, um, you know, 87 to 97. So maybe you say 95. You say, all right, we kind of hash the number. So I need I need a $25,000 raise to be comfortable with that contract hire position. And they're more flexible with you to be like, okay. Now they may say no, they may say yes, but you're, you're typically likely to get paid more as a contract to hire position than you are as a salaried developer. And that's part of the reason is you're paying more in taxes. You're sometimes your benefits are worse and you know, you don't have 401k, whatever it may be. And so that's one of the reasons that you may uh, get a higher salary. Now what is, so you're saying that sounds like a lot of cons. Uh, but let's talk about the pro of that. If they, if you do get that role and you go from 70 to 95,000, you can, roughly command a $95,000 salary at your next job. And uh, it may not be perfect. You may drop down to 85,000, for instance, for a salaried role um, or whatever you may, whatever it is, but someone paid you that, now you're worth that, right? And so uh, that, that's a little simplistic. And obviously you have to prove your worth with your skill set. and the goal is to get hired on. And sometimes in those contract to hire positions, you don't actually, they're not in any obligation to hire you. Like Disney in that instance, it's not any obligation to hire hire you. Uh, and what may happen is uh, Disney just renews your contract with that company. And a lot of times what will happen is they'll try and lure you in and say, you know, Disney might hire you at the end of this. And Disney will the whole time just um, like um, renew your contract with the, the recruiting agency, with the, um, the employment agency. And so you'll just work for this company this whole time. Uh, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but you just have to know your options, right? I don't want to when I when I talk about these things, I want people to know that the that I, I don't try and give you like I, I tend to stay away from contract to hire because um, I want to do what I want to do, and it's not beneficial to what I what my game plan is for the next five years of my life. Uh, but I want to give you I want you guys to be educated about the facts of how a lot of this stuff works. And we're talking in generalities with these tech recruiting uh, companies and employment agencies. But uh, these are the things that you need to ask because typically the benefits will be worse. Typically the PTO and the paid holidays will be non-existent or uh, worse. And so, and I've, I've after talking with these, it, it depends. I've had ones where you get zero PTO. I've had ones where you've had five days of PTO. I've had ones where you've had 10 days of PTO, but typically they're worse. And you need to factor that into your salary because if you, in that instance, say, "Hey, I'm going from sixty-five thousand to seventy thousand, five thousand dollar raise," and you're like, "Okay, cool. I didn't really like where I'm working. I'm okay taking a little bit of risk um, for a good opportunity." And before you know it, you're like, "Man, things are rough, man. Why? Why is it going by?" Because the actual amount of money that you're making with just that five thousand dollar raise is you actually lost 
five thousand dollars in actual money income money into your pockets by taking that contract to hire position from that salaried position so you need to know these things uh, because a recruiter is not going to tell you it they're just say yeah man five thousand dollar raise good for you bro uh you know what, whatever it is um but because of that because of the salary increase uh as i was saying you may be able to command a higher salary because a lot of times Places will ask you, well, what are you making now? And, you know, they'll try and justify it off that. And it's not a good practice, but it, it is what it is. Um, so you have that to think about as well. Um, but that's really my two cents about uh, contract to hire. Uh, one, they can open up some doors for you that maybe wouldn't normally be open because less people want the roles. That's not to say that nobody wants the roles. There's plenty of people that do contract to hire and um, they're happy about it. Um, and uh, another benefit is that there, if you're if you're local, if you're um, a native English speaker, in, in my case, right, in in America, you might be uh, a better candidate than if they have to uh, get somebody out of the country because they have to go through a whole bunch of processes, get them a visa. They have to typically pay a um, a relocation fee, which is normally something that doesn't happen as well when you. Uh, when you deal with contract to hire, but that, that's more of a case on case basis. On a salary developer, when they want to hire you on for a company, usually they'll offer you relocation money into your contract. And um, there's some contingencies with that, but usually it's somewhere around $5,000 to say, hey, um, we want you, you're, you're gonna work in house, so wherever you're living, you're in Minnesota, this is in Florida or California, here's $5,000 that you know we expect you to be with the company for a year and we'll knock $500 off of it. Uh, it's basically like, at least in my experience, it's been like kind of like a loan where uh, they say, okay, well, we're expecting you to stay. We're going to give you $5,000 cash up front. And every month that you're working with us, we want you to, uh, if you're here for a year, $5,000 is gone. It's all yours. Enjoy it after that. Uh, but if you leave at six months, you owe us $2,500, right? And so it depends on the company, but that's different. But that, that money to relocate you, it's harder to get that when you're contract to hire. So you, you might have to deal a cost, another cost out of pocket, and it's expensive to move, right? Maybe you have to break a lease. Maybe you need to rent a truck and move all your shit. Um, you might spend $5,000 yourself to get there, which, which is why that's a very reasonable amount. But uh, the pros and the cons you got, just be aware of the, the money implications as well as the opportunities that it can open up with contract to hire. Um, so for me, it's a little too risky right now. So early on in my career and... I, I, it would take, it would take something pretty phenomenal and I would be more open to contract to hire. Um, if I was looking for work with one year contracts, but that usually doesn't happen. Uh, a lot of times what happens is you'll get hired for six months or like they do a contract to hire period where, you know, and then let's say they, they hire you in June, but at, in every January, they renew contracts for a year. So you might work from June to January, and then you'll find out if you have a job after uh, some, sometime in January for another year. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just be a little too stressful. Uh, and I, I encourage people to jump around and check out their options and see what their market value is worth, which is why I say take those recruiter calls and uh, see what it's worth as a salary developer, see what it's worth contract to hire. And um just know all your options and what they really do for you. But that's my very long, uh, I don't wanna call it a rant, my, my very long section on contract to hire pros and cons. I hope that when you're looking for roles and if you're just getting started, uh, contract to hire is great, but a lot of times they want you, it's more of a senior to mid-level role, contract to hire, because they're trying, they're an agency hiring for a company. Uh, they're not a company that's willing to groom you a lot of the times, so which is, uh, one, one thing it's like, Oh, that sounds great. Sounds like easier way. Not really if you have no experience. So uh, there's just a little caveat there, but thanks for watching guys. Don't forget to join our Facebook page, code tech and caffeine so that you can stay up to date with software coding, immerse yourself into the, the culture a little bit. We got, I believe 1700 members now, which we're growing a couple hundred a week, which is really good. And, uh, if you want to support me and you want to support the channel, you can at patreon.com slash coding tutorials 360. I appreciate you guys watching the video. If you have any questions, as always, leave them in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, stay motivated, stay hungry, keep working hard, and uh, stay in the grind. I'll see you guys next time. Hey, guys, thanks for watching the video. If you're interested in coding boot camp, check out devmountain.com, 
where housing is included in your price of tuition. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share and support me on Patreon. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.